Starting us off with bumblebee biology is Dr. Jamie Strange, who is professor and the chair of the Department of Entomology here at The Ohio State University. He came in uh, 2019, right before the, uh, the pandemic, so really uh, not trial by fire, maybe trial by virus, uh, but really hit the ground running uh, with, with research, teaching uh, with graduate students, undergrads, and um, also outreach programs, helping all of us to learn more about bumblebees. Before he was here at Ohio State, Jamie was with the ARSB lab in Logan, Utah, where for years he researched bumblebees, uh, before that um, honeybees, um, focusing on a lot of, of uh, conservation issues, also disease issues of bumblebees. He's really a prolific author, and if you go to his contact information, you'll see uh, many of the, the projects and research papers that Jamie's uh, authored and co-authored over the years. Um, really nationally and internationally recognized as a bumblebee expert. He works a lot with partnerships, um, drawing folks together to tackle some difficult conservation issues around those flying teddy bears. And if you happen to upload a picture to Bumblebee Watch, uh, the community science app, uh, chances are it's Jamie or one of his team of, of coming together, looking at your bumblebee and helping to um, identify that for you. So, Jamie, thanks so much. Really always uh, appreciate your time. And uh, thanks for giving us a nice foundation in the biology of those bumblebees. Well, thanks for that uh, really nice introduction, Denise. I appreciate it. I'm going to multitask here and try to get my screen shared so that you can all be seeing my presentation, which I think at this point you can. Yes. Um, yes. So yeah, so I'm 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 joining. I am, I am the the a professor and the chair of the Department of Entomology at Ohio State. I'm joining you today from um, Los Angeles, California, where I'm visiting my daughter. So I'm sitting in a hotel room right now, and uh, one of the, as Denise alluded to, the miracles of um, modern technology and necessities of the pandemic is we're all um, able to get together anyway. And I see that we have about. 1500 participants. So that's pretty incredible. This is probably the largest group I've ever talked to. So I'll try not to let that get in my head um, as we move forward. I noticed in the Q&A as Denise was talking that a bunch of people were asking about the East-West Bumblebee divide and identification. It's a pretty fuzzy line, as you might imagine, um, because uh, things don't just switch biologically from the east to the west, but the eastern folks are mostly going to focus on things that are really Great Plains um, and east of that. So not, not really the Mississippi, it goes fairly farther west. The, the taxa that we find, the bumblebee species we find that we call eastern species really um, go pretty far into, into the um, farther west than the Mississippi, I should say. So, and then uh, Western species kind of start, if you think about the front range of the Rockies um, and a little bit out into the prairie there, um, that's where the West begins uh, and the taxes sort of switch uh, as we go from there. There's gonna be some overlap. There's some species that go coast to coast. So they'll probably be covered in both sessions. Um, I'm not raising, I'm not um, leading those sessions, so I can't promise exactly what they're gonna do, but. But that's the the rough line. We think about the one hundredth pair, uh, the one hundredth meridian, as as kind of a good dividing point um, in that region. So, um, yep, right, right down the middle of the continent. Um, all right. Well, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get into my talk and and not talk about other people's talks at this point. Uh, today, I'm gonna cover, as Denise said, a, a sort of intro to bumblebee biology, um, and uh, hopefully. You know, we'll kind of talk about this group of bees that are in the genus Bombus um, and what bumblebees are, um, what the bumblebees do, uh, that's how they spend their time. And then um, we're going to talk a bit more next week about bumblebees. And I'm going to give you a kind of high level overview of, of some of the things that kill them. A lot of the work my lab does these days is on bumblebee parasites and pathogens. And so We'll talk about parasites and pathogens and how those impact uh, bumblebees, populations, colonies, individuals, uh, those kind of things. So, um, and then we'll also touch a little bit next week on um, things you might be seeing right now. Uh, for a lot of you, it's the time of year when bumblebees, uh, the queen bumblebees are beginning to emerge. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today, but we'll talk a little bit more next week as well and, and what you might be seeing and, and some of the behaviors you could look for uh, out in the wild. So if you keep uh, putting your questions into the uh, Q&A, that will be perfect. And um, uh, 
uh, Denise is going to, as she said, we're going to stop about midway through this and she'll, she'll kind of curate those and lump them together. And then if um, there's more questions uh, at that point, I'll answer what we can, and then we'll move on into the second half of today's uh, presentation and hopefully um, get through all that. And like I said, I'll see you again next week if we don't finish up everything today. Well, I'll see you next week anyway. Um, so, so bumblebees, the, the genus Bombus uh, is uh, a large, well, fairly large um, group of bees. There are about 265 species that occur worldwide. Um, and this map is uh, from, from Paul, the well, map's actually from Paul Williams, and it shows, uh, who's, who's a researcher in the UK, uh, and it shows the approximate numbers of species um, of bumblebees in different parts of the world. Um, that make up this 265. And, and that number, you know, when I first really started working at Bumblebees 15 years ago or so, we thought there were somewhere just, just shy of 250 species. And as we've done more work and we've looked at uh, molecular techniques to kind of tease apart uh, what real species are, uh, that number's crept up slowly. And I imagine I put the plus sign there because I'm sure this isn't going to be the final um, to this. We're going to find more species and we're going to find more um, more differences in what we call sort of the cryptic species. So a lot of bumblebees kind of look alike, but they behave a little differently and live in different parts of the world. And as we investigate them, we realize that really, um, yeah, they look similar, but but they're actually different species. Um, so that's what this map shows. And what it also shows is that this center of diversity of bees really came out of um, kind of the area of the Himalayan plateau. Um, this in, in uh, what biogeographically we call this oriental region. And so they've moved out through the Arctic um, and into North America, probably multiple colonizations across this uh, Beringian land bridge uh, when that, at times when that existed. Um, and those bees then moved in through, you know, in through Alaska and Canada and into um, what's modern day, um, you know, uh, United States, Mexico, and then down into South America. Um, and so the new world has a pretty good, uh, diversity of bees that have spread around. Um, and, and we have very, uh, distinct, uh, fauna between South America and North America. So we really don't have overlap between those two groups as far as species go. Um, and we also don't have much overlap with, um, the, the Palearctic, the, um, European, uh, and, and, uh, Asian species. However, there are a few species which are um, circumpolar on the, the, really the polar species. Some of those actually occur throughout uh, Scandinavia, uh, Northern Russia and uh, Northern Canada and, and Alaska and Greenland. So there's a couple species that, that really do kind of go, go around the world, if you will, but really on that Northern part. You'll notice too, that there's no um, tags in, um, in Africa or Australia. Uh, and few also in, in some of the, the um, uh, oceanic islands uh, out in, in, um, in the Pacific and Indian Ocean. Uh, and that's because bumblebees weren't uh, really common there or, or not present there at all. There's uh, you know, a few subspecies of uh, species and subspecies that occur in Northern Africa, um, uh, Atlas Mountains and things like that, where uh, there are some records of bumblebees, but they're not very common there. Uh, in Australia, there's no uh, native bumblebees. Uh, there were introductions of uh, bumblebees from the UK to New Zealand in the 18, late 1800s, early 1900s, and they were brought in for pollination of agricultural crops, like um, primarily clovers, uh, that were not pollinated by the, the bees in, or not well pollinated by the bees in uh, New Zealand. And so there are now bumblebees that live in New Zealand. Um, and uh, those are all originating from the UK. And there's some interesting stories surrounding those with conservation as well. Um, it's, it's kind of a little refuge for bumblebees there. Um, and then also in Tasmania, bumblebees were introduced commercially in 1992 for pollination of greenhouse crops. Um, and and those, that's the only spot in, uh, in Australia where they're, they are present. They're not in the Australian mainland. Um, and so uh, talking a little bit about these uh, the bees that are the general habitat of bumblebees. So you, you'll, Denise referred to them as flying uh, teddy bears, I think. And, and that's because their, uh, their bodies are generally covered with um, this thick pile or hair. 
Um, and it's, that's, you know, an adaptation that helps keep them warm. They have these big robust bodies, so they have less um, surface area to body mass. Again, that, that's another adaptation to cold weather. And so we typically find most of them in these temperate boreal and Arctic regions. Um, and where they aren't in those, they typically inhabit um, high elevation sites. So they're in more of an alpine situation, again, um, where the weather is cooler and they're well adapted to that. And we'll talk about some other adaptations to, to cold weather, but um, this, uh, the one other thing I wanna show you here is there's this large chart on the, on the right. And this is a, what we call a, 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 a phylogenetic tree of the bumblebees. And, um, and so there's a lot of this at the time was when this was published in 2007 was most of the known species uh, and how they're related to each other. And you'll notice there are these sort of clumps there uh, that show relationship um, of different groups. And some of these are occur generally in different parts of the world and some are pretty widespread. So we'll dig a little bit into that as we go. The other, the last thing I'll point out on before I move to the next slide is that, that we can group these sort of lumps here into these things called subgenera. Um, and so there's one genus of Bombus, but there we can we can kind of uh, decide you know, through these um, phylogenetic methods which ones are most closely related. And those groups we put together we call subgenera. And this is kind of useful for scientists and how we think about the way they behave um, and how they've evolved, but also uh, the parasites and pathogens that they um, get and how they react to those. Uh, and also there's some really interesting sort of conservation questions surrounding those because it tends to be that certain closely related species within subgenera kind of react to those threats to their, themselves and their habitat um, similarly. So uh, it's, it's a good way to think about the bees um, in, in a way that, that gives us some information that we can actually act on. Oops, let's see, I gotta find the right button to move slides here. All right. So focusing in on North America, we have about 48 species. And again, I use that about because these numbers are likely to change. Uh, you can see that in Paul's map, he had 46 in the Western Nearctic and 33 in the Eastern Nearctic. And a lot of those actually overlap. Uh, so that doesn't add up to uh, 48, but, um, but it's pretty close. And there are some which are just really um, restricted to that, uh, the more polar regions as well. So we're not gonna see them here in, uh, certainly not where I'm sitting in California or where somebody, where I normally sit in Ohio, uh, we don't see all of these species at one time. They are actually, uh, each, each location you're in, location you're in is gonna have a very um, unique fauna that's associated with that. And so uh, you can't expect to see every bumblebee uh, that occurs in any one particular place. Um, some places have much higher diversity and other places have much lower diversity. Um, and it really depends on where you are in the ecosystem you live in. Um, there are 13, uh, 13 species which are unique to uh, Central America uh, and, and some of our sort of what we consider the North American species kind of bleed into that, but um, there are 13 that just don't simply come north of the border of Mexico. So uh, again, there are species there. And then there's, um, if you go into South America, there are uh, a fairly good diversity of bumblebee species, and most of those are restricted to um, high elevation Andes Mountains. There are a few species which occur in the Amazon basin, but it's not a particularly uh, uh, rich fauna in, in the tropics. It's the, some of the few tropical bumblebees in the world live in the Amazon. Uh, so there are some there, but most of the, again, again, are in the mountains. Um, and that's where the highest diversity typically occurs. So, what are bumblebees? Well, one of the things that separates bumblebees from a lot of other bees um, is, is the fact that they have uh, this primitively used social behavior. And it's one of the really fascinating things that, that makes them both, both um, important as pollinators, but also kind of just really cool to study. Um, and, uh, and so this eusociality is, is a trait that we see in, in a number of uh, insects really, um, but we think about it really mostly in relation to like bees, ants, termites, um, and, and those are kind of the main groups that have sort of the classic examples of eusociality. Um, but um, so this primitive eusociality contrasts with what we see in ants and, and honeybees uh, and termites in that um, it, it's not a social cycle which uh, is, is always there. So um, it means that bumblebees, like things like paper wasps or um, yellow jackets, 
uh, they have an, a cycle where they have a period of time where the queen is alive without the colony. And then there's a social cycle where you have a queen who establishes the colony. Now, most of the time in these um, organisms, they're evolved to these climates where we have, um, where we do have actually cold winters uh, and, um, and the queen has to go into a solitary phase of dormancy to survive. Uh, however, when she then initiates a colony, we go into this, um, this eusocial phase, uh, eusocial meaning truly social, uh, and the definition of that, there are really three important points in a youth social phase. And one is that you have reproductive division of labor. So in this picture, you can see this is a, a Bombus huntii nest uh, that I, I raised out in Utah. And in this picture, here's the queen right here. I hope you all can see this. Um, and, uh, and then we have a bunch of workers here. And so she's sitting on this brood lump. These are all different cells. Um, these, most of these are pupae that we can see in this picture, although it's a couple larvae right over here. Uh, and, um, oops, sorry, jumped ahead. Um, so the, the queen is, is on here and she's the one who's responsible for laying eggs. And, and the workers are then responsible for brood care. And so uh, this is a reproductive, the reproductive division of labor. The workers are not reproductive uh, primarily. And I say primarily because again, unlike honeybees, bumblebee workers will actually lay eggs that can develop. Um, based on the uh, genetics of bees and the way that sex is determined in bees, any egg that a, that a worker lays will develop only into a male bumblebee. So workers cannot produce other workers and workers cannot produce new queens. That's the queen's job um, because she is the only mated individual in the colony. And so uh, the queen is going to lay the eggs. That's the reproductive division of, uh, division of labor. There will be overlapping generations. Of course, the queen is the mother and the workers are her daughters. So we have an overlap there. Uh, and then we have this cooperative brood care where the daughters of that queen will assist her in raising more of their sisters. So they are cooperatively caring for the brood in the nest. And in this picture, you can see that very clearly. They're all on top of the cells. They're providing heat. They're they're making sure there's no uh, parasites that are crawling around the nest. Um, they will feed the new larvae as the, the larvae, the, the eggs hatch and the, and the larvae are developing. Um, and so this is our primitively eusocial habitat right here. Um, uh, at the same time, we have to remember that that queen's gonna go through this cycle of um, having a social and a solitary phase. And in fact, as we'll dive into here, sometimes the solitary phase is much uh, longer than the social phase. All right, so I wanna walk through this sort of general annual colony life cycle, and then we'll dig into it some more. We're actually gonna we're gonna spend most of our time talking about this life cycle and how this works. Um, queens are, are spending their winter in, um, in, they essentially hibernate. They go into a state called, we call diapause, uh, which is a state of reduced metabolic activity. Uh, they overwinter generally um, by themselves and, um, although they sometimes clustered in, in groups of queens, but, but essentially it's a, a solitary phase where they're not really interacting with other individuals. In the spring, she's gonna emerge from her hibernacula uh, and then she'll establish a nest in the summer. Um, the colony will grow and we're gonna spend some time on this. And then by late summer, new reproductives um, are coming and the colony size, uh, uh, colony size will actually decrease as individual workers die and the males um, begin to leave the nest to mate. And then uh, new gynes, which is a term we use for queens that are um, not yet heading their own colony, and new gynes will emerge. They will mate with those males out and outside of the nest usually. Um, and then they'll begin the cycle again by finding a new wintering home. That's the broad overview. Um, I'm gonna pause here. Denise, do we have questions? Looks like we have a few things in the Q&A. Anything pertaining to this section? Uh, sorry, Jamie, not, uh, not that I can see quickly. All right, okay. Just, I noticed the Q&A was popping up, so I wanted to make sure there's nothing I needed to answer right now. Okay, so um, before we go too much into colony cycle and dig deeply into that, I wanna talk about what bumblebees eat. And um, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that, that bumblebees um, are related to honeybees. They're related to um, uh, other bees, the stingless bees in, in uh, the tropics and, uh, and um, the orchid bees. There are this group called the corbiculate bees, meaning that instead of 
having just a clump of hairs on their legs or their abdomen to collect pollen, they actually have these uh, specialized pollen structures on their hind legs called corbiculi. Um, the common name for those is pollen baskets. And so essentially their hairs to kind of, um, you know, bend in uh, on a flat part of their leg and they can pack pollen into that. And so as the bees are out on a flower, here's a little, uh, this is a Western bumblebee, Bombus occidentalis on some phacelia. Um, and it's, it's gathering pollen and nectar and it will actually um, make a pellet of pollen. It'll comb all the, the pollen that collects on its, on its pile. It'll comb it all together kind of pack it into a ball on its leg and then it transports that back to the hive. The advantage of this is that it allows bumblebees to actually carry quite a bit of pollen relative to um, some other bee species. So they can have pretty large pollen loads. We, we talk more about that as we go as well. A um, couple things to know about pollen and, and what this is. It is the um, male reproductive gamete of plants. Um, and, and, and of course, most of you know, most of you are here because you're aware that um, pollination is a really important process. Plants can't get up and move um, to the, you know, from one plant to another to exchange pollen. So they rely on animals to do it. Um, bees being probably chief among those as far as the actual tonnage of pollen that they're moving throughout the world. Um, but there are a number of other important pollinators out there, bats, birds, butterflies, uh, not just bumblebees, but the real diversity of bees. There's lizards and there's actually just recently a cockroach, which was documented to be a pollinator. So yay cockroaches um, for joining this exclusive club of important um, animals that, that keep the world running. Um, I, I know most of you probably aren't excited about the cockroach like I am, but um, I, think, I find it pretty fascinating. Um, but back to the bumblebees um, and to, to the pollen. Uh, so it's the male reproductive gamete. It is high in protein. It's high in, um, there's a lot of oils involved in it, uh, in the composition of pollen. And it's also got a lot of minerals in it. So it's actually nu nutritionally very important. Um, and it's necessary for bumblebees to, uh, to rear brood. One of the main distinctions that sets bees apart from wasps, which they are derived from, so bees are really just wasps. I know a lot of people don't want to hear that, but it's true, um, that, that is bees are vegetarian uh, in general. There are a few species of bee which will feed on animal protein, uh, but most bees get their protein from plants, and most of that comes in the form of pollen. Um, this, this is important. They need to continue to go out and, and collect a lot of that. It's both val it's valuable for the plant, but it's also valuable for the bees as a food source. The other thing that bees get from flowers and is also really critical is nectar. Nectars can actually be sometimes relatively simple, but it's often a complex mixture uh, of sugars in a, in a water solution. So it's, uh, um, there's, there all plants are different and plants, even the same species of plant can actually um, produce a different composition and nectar depending on the environmental conditions in which it's producing it. But generally there's sucrose, there's some glucose, some fructose. Uh, there can be other sugars like maltose and galactose and other things that are um, minor components, but the, the main three are certainly sucrose, glucose, and fructose. Uh, again, nectar can have oils in it. It also, um, this is where uh, you'll notice that flowers often have uh, an odor um, and uh, that's often generated by the oils. You can think of sort of essential oils as the kind of things that often smell like the flowers they come from. Um, some of that will leach into the nectar naturally. Um, some may be excreted into the nectar naturally, but there's some oil in there. Um, and and the, the important thing about nectar is that it, it's really, a fuel for flight and nest thermoregulation. Um, and so the bees will collect this not to necessarily feed to their larvae, which are developing, that's what the pollen's for, but they will use this nectar because it's a quick um, energy source for flight, which is metabolically very expensive. Um, and so um, if you think about it, is flying um, from one flower to another is essentially like us running from every room we go to to every other room. It takes a lot of energy to do. Um, and, uh, and so it takes a lot of sugar to fuel that. Um, and then nest thermoregulation is the other really important part. So bee, bumblebees can generate a lot of, actually generate a lot of heat. Um, 
And uh, they do that by generally vibrating their thoracic um, flight muscles, uh, which is really dense muscle. And as they vibrate that, it you know just uh, they can vibrate it like we would shiver, and that generates a lot of um, temperature for them. Um, it also, you know, if you think about this, it makes a lot of sense. Honeybees, why do they collect nectar to make honey? Well, they do it because they need to generate heat all winter long. Um, and they're not eating pollen to do that. They're eating the stored nectar in the form of honey to do that. Bumblebees don't have a winter phase where they need that. The queen actually, when she um, will hibernate, she does it with all of the nutrients on board that she's got. They're in her body at that point. Um, so they don't store honey in quantities like you would see in a honeybee colony, um, but they do store a little bit of uh, surplus uh, nectar just to kind of get through the, the tough, spat, tough patches. Um, but really it's for flight. So you'll not often notice bumblebees out foraging on flowers and they will uh, go ahead and, and, and just get nectar and then move to the next flower without collecting any pollen because uh, maybe the pollen is low quality at that flower and they're looking for a better source and they're just fueling up to get to it. Um, bumblebees are what we call diet, oops, jumping ahead, dietary generalists. Um, and I, I like to say that they have these majors and minors. And so you'll see certain bumblebees, which um, here's a, an array of different flowers uh, that you can see if I can find my cursor over here and some bumblebees on some of them. Um, and some bumblebees will really go to certain kinds of flowers. Others uh, will avoid those. So different species of bumblebees. So what I think of this is they have different preferences. Um, they're also buzz pollinators. And I'm gonna go into buzz pollination in a minute, um, but it's a, a behavior which is restricted to certain groups of bees. Other bees don't do it. Uh, and, and bumblebees are actually highly effective crop pollinators of certain crop plants. Buzz pollination is also called sonication. Uh, here's a little Bombus huntii in a greenhouse. You can actually, if you look here, you can see her and you can see her little pollen pellet. This is a yellow pollen pellet that she's gotten from these tomato plants. Uh, this was an experiment we were doing in a greenhouse um, looking at bumblebee pollination of tomatoes. Uh, and what the, the bumblebees do that's um, primarily to solanaceous or the tomato, uh, the nightshade family, and then ericaceous, which is sort of the blueberries and the vaccinium um, plants, is they'll, they'll bite the flower and they'll curve their abdomen. You can see how she's curved her abdomen around the bottom of that flower. Um, once she bites a hold of those petals, she'll vibrate those flight muscles again without, she actually is able to decouple them from her wings. So she can vibrate the flight muscles without moving her wings. Um, and that causes a sort of high pitched buzz sound. And if you're standing by the flower, um, you can hear, you can actually hear it go bzz, bzz, bzz. It's kind of a cute little sound. Um, and uh, and uh, what she's doing is she's vibrating that. What it does is it shakes. And in, in the case of solanaceous plants, they have um, what are called porocidal anthers. So the anther is where the pollen is held. Uh, and it vibrates those anthers and the pollen is released um, with this vibration. And so she's able to extract more pollen um, through sonicating than she would um, if she just went up and tried to dig it out. Um, and actually what's interesting is certain bees like honeybees, which don't sonicate, they don't have any interest in um, tomato plants. Tomatoes offer very little nectar. And at the same time, the pollen is hard to get to. So honeybees, if they were to land on this, they wouldn't be able to access that, that pollen and they would just fly away. To them, it's a, a useless flower. But to the bumblebee, there's a lot of pollen that's inside of there. So they can use this um, ability to, uh, to sonicate to get that out and to have access to it. And then once it's on, it sort of lands on their belly because she's got her belly right underneath it. And then she combs it off and she packs it into her corbiculae um, to transport back to the, the colony. Um, so interesting behavior and it allows, it actually makes, that's why bumblebees are used commercially in greenhouses um, because they're highly efficient pollinators of a lot of the plants we grow in greenhouses, um, and um, but also out, out in nature. So most nightshades in nature are pollinated uh, by bumblebees as the primary um, organism. So I wanna take a little pause here. This is where we'll, we'll just break for a minute. Uh, we don't, you don't have to go anywhere, um, but if you choose to, that's fine. Um, so I'm gonna answer some of the questions in the Q and A, but one thing I wanted you to drop into that um, is maybe just, kind of type in um, things you've seen bumblebees foraging on as we're, as we're going through. I'll, I'll start answering questions, but if you think of things that you, 
different plants, maybe in your yard. Um, and uh, you can use either the, the common name or the Latin name if you know it. Um, so Jamie, let's have them put that into the chat box. So guys, I turn the chat box back on for everyone. Well, there so you go. Put the, those Great. plants in there. And Jamie, if you don't mind, we're going to do a lightning round Q and A on queens. Let's do it. All right. So when does a queen mate? Hmm. Yeah. So in that life cycle, you will see um, what we're going to come back to this shortly, and I'll, you'll see another couple really nice graphs of life cycles that I didn't make um, that actually talented artists made. Um, and uh, those will show you that, that really at, at the end of the summer, those new guines come out of those nests and males are coming out of other nests and they're flying out and they're mating um, out uh, outside of the nest. But usually it's late summer. So for most of um, North America, that's going to be between August and the end of September. Um, some places it'll go a little longer and it's also a little variable on species, but usually it's late summer, early fall. Okay. Um, lots of people asked where the queen overwinters. They don't want to disturb her or take away her habitat. So where is she overwintering? Well, there's the, the million dollar question. Um, yeah. So we don't know a lot about queen overwintering. Uh, we know that um, from a few studies, well, mostly anecdotal evidence of people digging them up, they usually nest a couple inches, you know, five to six centimeters below the soil surface. Um, sometimes they'll just simply go underneath things like pine duff or, or, or um, fallen leaves. Um, and we, we don't have a good sense of how they choose those locations. We kind of think they choose north facing slopes that are likely to, um, where the snow is likely to melt the latest and that keeps them, it also helps moderate the soil temperature, because one thing that happens if the sun hits the soil, it can warm up very quickly and, and uh, the bees can uh, maybe activate before they should if there's not a, a good blank blanket of snow. Um, so yeah, we don't, we don't have a great idea. And, and you're we're actually going to talk about that more throughout this course. And Sam Drogi, I think, is going to talk a little bit about a program that uh, a bunch of us have come together to hope that we can actually answer this question. So without giving too much away, we don't really know. Um, and we're trying to find out. It's a pretty active area of research. Okay. How does she survive the cold? Yeah, well, I've got a little bit on that later too, but- um, We can skip uh, that if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, well, they, they, you know, bees, the bumblebees are pretty good at, first of all, being below the soil, the soil surface. And what um, we know is if you put a soil probe, say two inches, five centimeters, um, 600 meters below the surface of the soil, uh, once there's, th th that's actually fairly, um, insulating to uh, most temperatures and they can actually dig a little deeper too. So in areas where uh, like if you're, if they're in Alaska, they'll actually dig a little deeper than that and actually get down into, um, uh, you know, a, a, a more stable temperature. Um, so they look for the stability of temperature and not so much the uh, not freezing. Um, but if they get down far enough, it's not too bad. Um, temperatures tend to regulate and be pretty, pretty um, constant. And then once you get a blanket of snow on the soil, it actually, what we found was in Utah was that even when it would be minus, you know, 10 Fahrenheit outside, the, um, the temperature where the bees would be at, at five to six centimeters was actually pretty constant. It was about 33 degrees Fahrenheit, so just above freezing. So they actually are pretty good at locating that temperature where they're not gonna freeze, uh, but, but they do also produce, um, and I'll, this is what I'll get into a little later, they actually kind of have some natural antifreeze that builds up in their body um, at the end of the season uh, in the fall as they're getting ready to winter. So that helps them from, from having cellular damage from freezing, like frostbite. Okay. There were other questions. I'll bet you're going to get to this. Um, how many eggs she produces, how she decides to lay um, eggs that will be males. Um, and how many queens might be produced from a colony? So those are all, yes, great yes, questions. Yeah. And we're going to get right to them. So, um, all right. So yeah, let's dive back into it. Um, let's see on the, what have you seen uh, bumblebees foraging on? We have a nice long list, um, which includes yeah, asters, penstemons, milkweeds, clovers, other legumes, sweet pea, native sweet pea, Monarda. Yeah, Monarda is a huge one. Um, at least in my yard, um, borage, some annual sunflower, um, 
Yeah, Borage. Great stuff here. Golden Rods. Yep. The Golden Rods, great end of the season. You see a lot of males actually on those. Um, sunflowers, same thing. A lot of males on those. Although there are a couple of bumblebee species where the, the workers will forage on those a lot. Figworts, buttercup hazelnut. Um, manzanita. Manzanita is a great um, queen plant. We uh, often find a lot of find a lot of queens on manzanita out certainly out west here. Um, Rose of Sharon, cone flowers, allium, dahlias. Yeah, there's a lot of great stuff here. So thank you everybody for putting stuff in there. Yeah. So again, you can see just scrolling through the chat the breadth of um, flowers that bumblebees will visit. Um, it is actually uh, a pretty remarkable. And, and so pretty much anywhere you are, you can find uh, something that the bumblebees will like. All right, so some of the, the important ones uh, for uh, in the economic sense, um, as pollinators, well, tomatoes, obviously about, uh, there's about $609 million um, worth of tomatoes grown um, in greenhouses annually. And um, bumblebees are the main pollinator just of that industry. Uh, that, that number's from 2012, so I'm sure it's probably pushing a billion now, but um, very, very important crop. Um, blueberries, cranberries, uh, pumpkins, watermelons all also have uh, huge amounts of uh, bumblebee pollination with them. Um, and, uh, and, and some of those, while honeybees can be imported or you know, commercially to be used on those sites, uh, actually it's the native bees, the, the bumblebees, the squash bees, uh, the, the blueberry bees that are doing the bulk of the pollination work in those systems. And of course, bumblebees have an enormous uh, economic value on wildlands. Um, that is really actually nearly impossible to, to quantify. How do you, um, you know, put a dollar sign on, on a mountain meadow? Uh, and if we could do that, we'd probably be living in a, a more sustainable and better world. Uh, uh, but to sort of underscore the importance of bumblebees as pollinators, we have, um, there's at least, well, there's a couple species in North America, which are now um, produced commercially uh, and, and sent around the continent. Um, shipped around the continent for um, commercial use, Bombus and Patience being primary among those right now. And this is the common eastern bumblebee, um, which is native to eastern North America. This is a map from iNaturalist that should, or sorry, from GBIF, uh, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, that shows the, the native range. That's where most of these dots are uh, of Bombus and Patience. And then there's a few dots out in, uh, in Western North America, and that shows places where they've been introduced to. Um, and they've been managed since the 1990s. Really, they, it was about 1994, 1995 when they became commercially available. Um, and since the mid 2000s, they've been the main greenhouse pollinator uh, in North America and Central America. Um, and, and then there's just a little note here that about, so we, we ship both the United States ships into Canada and Canada ships into the United States. Um, and so there's a little bit of of movement across the border. About 9,000 colonies come from Canada to the United States annually. Uh, there's now two other species of bumblebees which have, are in growing as commercial pollinators, Bombus huntii in Western uh, Canada and um, Bombus vostasenskii in the Western United States. Um, both are, are native to those regions. And so um, there's, there's hope we can use more and more native bumblebee species and not ship um, Bombus and patients around the country because it's already become established in the Pacific Northwest in Washington and uh, British Columbia um, as escapees from greenhouses. So we wanna try to minimize the impacts that we have when we, we do that, but um, certainly there are some of those impacts which are already happening. So thinking about what bumblebees eat and, um, and how they, uh, how that, that compares to something like Apis mellifera, the, the, the honeybee, um, we did a study, this was a grad student of mine, Houston Judd, did this in the I think 2015 and 2016. He did some field observations and we, we went out and we established a honeybee apiary and then um, a bumblebee, uh, I don't know what we call that, a bombiary right next to it. So we had a bunch of bumblebee nests um, adjacent to the honeybee hives. And we affixed pollen traps uh, to the front of those both the honeybees and the bumblebees. And we looked at the proportion of of different plant sources that they were returning to the nest. 
Um, to sort of, we were, were curious, like how, you know, there's a lot of discussion about bumblebees and honeybees um, uh, competing for food sources uh, and how much of that overlap there was. And we found some really interesting results. And that is that, that both these are generalist species and they tend to, um, to forage on a lot of crops. And you'll notice that these, these bars, these are percentages, but they don't tally up to one because we eliminated from these graphs any, any plant family these are families of plants that don't, um, that represented less than 5% of the diet. So those ones uh, are not reflected here. It's only ones that were, um, that were foraged on relatively frequently. Um, and what's interesting you'll see is that the bumblebees really have some favorites. Um, certainly in early July, it was Fabaceae. This is the pea family. So this is probably mostly clover. Um, this site was actually located next to uh, an alfalfa field. Um, and there was a lot of clover. It was in, we were in an apple orchard, but we were in, which wasn't blooming at the time. Um, but it was located next to this. Um, they also, this is solanaceous plants. So again, July, there may have been some tomatoes and peppers in the area, but a, probably a lot of it's just nightshade um, that was out in the environment that they were, were going to. Um, so general nightshades here. Um, and then uh, rosaceae, so the rose family, and there could have been roses, there could have been, you know, it's a huge family with a lot of different things in it. So um, really early in the year, or I say early, early in this study, uh, early July and into August, um, the, at least Fabaceae and Solanaceae dominated their diet um, by a large proportion. Then you begin to see the Asteraceae, um, the asters and 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 those coming on later in the year um, and, and becoming more important. The, what's really interesting was with the honeybees is that we did not see nearly as much overlap. They don't feed on um, the Solanaceae pretty much at all. They avoid them. We found, no, we found just one or two Solanaceous pollen loads in all of what we looked at in the honeybee colonies. Um, so there's really not a lot of overlap there, but the, what we do see the overlap is in this, um, the pea family, um, right here, this is the Fabaceae, uh, Lamiaceae's mints. And again, bumblebees didn't seem that interested in mints, but honeybees certainly were. Um, and then, uh, and Asteraceae becomes a huge proportion of the honeybee diet as the season goes on. And what's also interesting is this Poaceae. And if you know, that's, that's grass. Um, so they were collecting a lot of grass pollen, which we typically think of grasses as wind pollinated. Um, but in fact, the, uh, the honeybees seem to like it. So the honeybees the, aren't really concerned whether the grass needs them to collect pollen. It's collecting it um, probably because it's a, an easy to get an abundant food source for their developing larvae. Um, so what the foragers do, I apologize, this is a little fuzzy. I, I cut this graph out of another presentation. Um, this is a study that a, a two students of mine, Abby Bauer and John Koch did, uh, where we were looking at um, how long uh, each bumblebee foraging trip took place. And so, in other words, when a bee leaves the nest, we would, we had little tags on these bees and they would fly out of the nest um, and we would time it to see how long they were foraging for. So until they got back in the hive. Um, and the blue here is nectar foraging. And some of these nectar foraging trips are actually, so we, we considered it nectar foraging if they returned without pollen in their corbiculae. Um, and so this is no pollen trips are, are blue and pollen trips are yellow. Um, and so those no pollen trips could be very short. So about, you know, 9% of them were less than five minutes long and nearly all of them were less than 45 minutes long. Um, so if they weren't out foraging for pollen, they typically did it very quickly, um, got their nectar, nectar and came back. For pollen foraging trips, you'll see, did it again, um, sensitive mouse, I guess. Um, Pollaging for pollen foraging trips could actually be very long. And in some cases, over two hours long um, that they would spend outside. And we we sort of uh, had a name for these bees, this one or 2% of foragers that were out for over um, an hour and a half. We called these the explorers. And our thought was they're probably out looking for new food sources. We don't really know because we, we could only stand at the hive. We couldn't follow them everywhere. But we think they were probably out looking for um, new things uh, and not... Um, doing an active foraging, but more of a scouting trip. Um, so we think that's what this is really, probably it's anything over an hour is that because they should be able to get a full pollen load within an hour and come back. But it was uh, interesting to us that there were some very long duration foraging trips. Um, 
but what you'll notice is that it takes longer generally to get pollen than it does to get nectar only. Um, and so those long, um, long pollen foraging trips take a while and they can spend a substantial time out there. I'll, you know, I think the average was about 30 minutes uh, for a pollen foraging trip versus about 15 minutes for a nectar foraging trip. The other interesting thing is we looked at the time of day, this is time of day, um, and then this is the proportion of foragers that came back with pollen. Um, and what's really interesting is that the more and more foragers come back with pollen uh, later in the afternoon. And so um, this is interesting, it sort of fits with some plant biology uh, as well, and that a lot of um, forage plants produce, uh, or, or a lot of plants produce nectar early. And once those nectaries get depleted by bee visits, they have to um, replenish that. Uh, and that's not an immediate process. So it takes a little bit of time for them to replenish it. And some only replenish it overnight. So it may be that the bumblebees are going out, um, they're collecting their nectar early in the day. And then by, by 10, 10 o'clock noon, they, um, or noon they they switch over to mostly pollen foraging because there's less nectar available. Um, so they're bringing that nectar back and they're, they're storing it short term in the hive, but then they have a nectar source they can feed on every time they come back to the nest and they need to fly out again. Um, and so we also see a, a cycle where the nectar in the nest will build up in the morning and then by evening, by the next morning, it's largely depleted because they, they will eat it all overnight just to keep going. Um, this again, from the same study, uh, we were looking, uh, at the, the, the total duration of, um, oh, now I, I got myself lost. I should have had notes on this one. <laughs> um, this was related to the previous one. And again, it's just to show that uh, the, the, the total number of events that, that bees do, um, they do most, I think this was in the nest. Um, and so these, if, as they come into the nest, they spend um, with, if they come in with nectar, they're only there for less than five minutes. Um, and so they go into the nest, they unload very quickly, um, and then they're back out to forage again. Um, some obviously come into the nest and they just stay there. Uh, they, and these were all during the day, we didn't measure overnight. So once the sun went down, we stopped uh, measuring duration of times. But um, so, so obviously a lot of them are spending time in the nest at night. Um, but if they're bringing pollen in, it actually takes them uh, over five minutes typically to unload that pollen. Some of them can do it in, in less than five minutes, but, but a lot of them are out um, five, 10, 20 minutes to unload pollen, get it in. So, so this is to sort of underscore that, that while pollen nutritionally is, is a higher reward, it also takes a lot more effort to gather. It's not, um, it's not a simple thing to collect it, to handle it, to pack it in your corbiculae, to fly back to the nest, then to unload it and put it somewhere in the hive where other bees can use it. Um, so, so um, it does. There are some costs to that high uh, reward nutrient source. All right. So now we're going to walk through. I think we've got. Uh, yeah, we've got a few minutes here. Um, so I got about twenty more minutes worth of talking, and then we'll jump into questions. Um, but I wanted to go into. Uh, the colony life cycle, because we've had a number of questions on that. And I want to, I'm going to walk through kind of how colonies grow. Um, this is from Jeremy Hemberger, um, who's a bumblebee researcher, and he did this really nice um, graph. And then he's, he willingly shares it with the rest of us, uh, which is very kind of him. So I'm going to use this from now on versus that picture one that I showed early on, which was one I made and wasn't nearly as nice. Um, so here's the, the wintering. This is the Queen bumblebee wintering, uh, you know, in the ground under a tree here. Uh, she emerges in spring. She'll nectar, find some flowers, uh, and then she does uh, these, these uh, nest searching flights. Uh, and we'll talk about this next week a little more about this emergence and the nest searching and how that happens. Um, but once she finds a, a spot, whether it's, you know, Jeremy's got it here in a log or here under the ground under a rock, uh, a lot of people talk about uh, bee, bumblebees preferring um, abandoned uh, rodent nests. Well, they do like abandoned rodent nests. Uh, they like a lot of other things too. Um, some species actually are arbor arboreal nesters and will frequently um, colonize your, your birdhouses that you put out. They like those. Um, they, there are documented records of bumblebees ejecting chickadees from their nests. So they will happily take over an occupied bird nest if it's there. Um, and the thought to me of a bumblebee kicking a bird out of a nest is kind of funny, but also a little 
disturbing that the bumblebees are that aggressive. Um, so that queen will find a spot. And again, they can vary some species, even nests like in grass clumps on the soil surface. You'll find them in compost heaps or wood piles, all kinds of places. Um, but they find they do this early in the spring that they'll or throughout the spring, I should say, that they'll find the nests and establish them. And the queen will forage. She forages for nectar and pollen and she makes a pollen lump. And once she gets that pollen lump here, she will oviposit on it. So she'll lay her eggs. And you see right here, a little cup. This is her proboscis into this little cup that she's built of wax. So she'll excrete wax from her um, abdominal um, wax glands and build these structures. Uh, and, and then she fills that with nectar and lays her eggs. And then she spends most of her time for the next several weeks uh, incubating that brood. Uh, and she does this by herself. Again, she, she um, uh, vibrates those thoracic muscles to generate heat. Uh, and she'll, you'll, if she's on top of the nest, you'll notice her, she, she lays her abdomen on top of the eggs uh, and she'll actually pump the abdomen back and forth as she vibrates the, her thoracic muscles. And that transfers a lot of um, heat into her abdomen. Uh, and she lays those right on top of the eggs so that they incubate at the right temperature. So she literally broods much like a bird would do. So maybe it's not that weird that she kicks chickadees out of their nests. I don't know. Um, so the, uh, so the queen does this, the eggs eventually, hat, well, the eggs hatch usually after three or four days, um, and then they develop into larvae. Those larvae will go through about a 21, 24 day, depending on species. They're all a little different life cy uh, cycle um, from larvae to pupae, and then they emerge as an adult after 21 to 24 days. So, um, so then you've got workers. And so she now has workers in the early summer. This, this should be over to the, the right a little under early summer, those workers emerge and they begin helping her. And they, in this uh, picture is to show that some are brooding and some are, are foraging and provisioning these nectar pots. And the other thing they'll do in these, sometimes if there's a surplus of pollen is they'll pack pollen into those and make them little pollen, pollen storage vessels. They don't gather a lot and you'll see some pictures coming up of actual bumblebee nests and you'll be able to see that the proportion of a brood to food storage is very skewed in the brood category, not the food storage category, um, but they do store some. Later in the summer, the colony gets very large um, and we'll, again, we'll get to this a little bit on how they decide to make um, uh, males um, that's coming up. But uh, suffice it to say, as the colony gets large, males are produced and then um, then the, the new males and the newly produced males and the uh, newly produced gynes, the unmated queens, will fly out of the nests, find hopefully someone from another nest to mate with, uh, and then they go through this wintering cycle again. So that's the sort of overview of the cycle, and let's dig into some of these different parts now. So uh, this uh, graph is completely hyped. I made these numbers up the other day, so um, do not expect these to be uh, reflective of reality wherever you're sitting. Um, they're just based on my experience with multiple species. Um, and this is to show how um, colony growth goes between two species that are real, um, Bombus impatiens and Bombus bimaculatus, um, both Eastern North American species. Uh, and, uh, and, and what you see is that in Bombus impatiens, uh, typically the queens emerge, they um, will begin nest founding uh, by the by April, or usually early April, depending where you are. Again, if you're farther north, this is going to be shifted. If you're farther south, it's going to be earlier. Um, but in, in Columbus, Ohio, where I usually observe these, early May or early April, the queens are out. Um, we begin to see some workers by early May. Uh, we still don't see any males. And then we see more and more workers in a nest. They'll be growing and growing and growing by the 1st of June. And by the 1st of July, we actually have a lot of workers and those persist through early August. Males in contrast, and then at some point, so you'll see queens flying here in the spring, but you don't see them then after early May, they more or less disappear for bombus impatiens. Uh, and then we don't see them again until July when they, uh, when new gynes are beginning to be uh, uh, produced um, and that they will not be, sorry, my cursor keeps disappearing. Um, but they won't become common until August and September. The males similarly only really start becoming common in August and September. Uh, and they persist longer than the females. So the, the, those workers 
are going to peak in July and August, and then they're going to quickly, um, the colonies will quick, quickly senesce um, in September. And by the 1st of October, pretty much the only thing you see are males and, and new, new gynes that are being uh, produced. Uh, by contrast, Bimaculatus is what we consider an early emerging species. And so this one, you're going to see workers many more workers relative to Queens in, in, uh, April, in May. You may actually see the workers as early as early March in, again, in Columbus. Um, and those numbers of workers are gonna grow uh, up into early June, early July, and then they're gonna decrease. Uh, and again, Queens, you're likely to see in July and August, and those are new Queens. Um, and they're pretty much done by the 1st of September. We're not gonna see a lot of these, of this species around. There are other species we'll see plenty of, but this species is done. So it's, its entire colony cycle is shifted about a month earlier than, than Bombus and Patience. Uh, the other thing you'll note here is that these scales are different. So uh, 200 workers for Bombus and Patience versus uh, a maximum of maybe 50 in a colony for Bombus bimaculatus. Because they come out early and they finish early, they have less time for the colony to grow. And so they grow quickly and then they, they um, drop off very quickly once the new reproductives are out. Um, we have these different phases we call initiation phase. That's when the colony is being initiated. So the queen is um, in there, she's laying eggs, she's provisioning herself. This is that solitary phase where she's alone in the colony doing all the work by herself. She's foraging, she's cleaning the nest, she's defending it, she's laying the eggs, she's incubating the brood, um, all the work's on her. So she, you can think about this, she can't produce that many workers, right? She only can do so much work. Um, and that's this initiation phase. Then we hit this exponential growth phase, which is um, really begins sometime in June uh, or late May. Uh, the colony will begin, we, you know, if you're watching it in the lab and you've got a nest, it kind of explodes. Uh, it just, there's bees everywhere. Um, this continues into July. Uh, and then we hit what's called a switching point. And this is somebody asked about how the queen decides when to lay male eggs. Um, and we don't know exactly how this happens. There's been some work on this. Um, and one of the things it seems like might be a stimulus is crowding. Um, it may also have to do with the quality and quantity of food which is coming in. Um, obviously there's a lot of foragers so they're bringing a lot in, but food quality also may decline later in summer. And that may be an indication that it's time to begin making reproductives. Um, it may also have to do with just some other uh, interesting things like the fact that as the colony grows in bumblebees, the queen begins to lose control of her workers um, and the workers can actually um, become kind of aggressive to the queen. And that may also be a stimulus to her to begin laying eggs, to begin laying male eggs and get the reproductives out at that point. And then in, late in the year, we get, uh, you know, August, September, we get this senescence phase where the colony is shrinking. They're not producing any new workers. It's all new reproductives, males and queens. And so um, because there's no new workers being uh, produced, the colony begins to, to get much smaller as the old workers die and the males and the new queens disperse. Uh, and so a colony can actually go from being what seems to be very strong and robust uh, into pretty much nobody there within a week or two once it begins to um, slow down. Um, so I'm gonna walk through these phases with some pictures so you can see what this looks like in an actual bumblebee nest and I can point out some of the the um the the features so in the early summer this is a again bombus huntii this is a species we worked with a lot out in um utah when i was there um so that's why you see a lot of these uh because i raised millions of nests of these it seems so um here's here's bombus huntii this is an early summer nest so there's you could see i don't know five to six workers this is the, really the first brood clutch here's the queen in the center of the nest zooming in there she is. Um, these are pupil cells, these ones that have this light in, in the center and then the sort of dark waxiness on the outside. Um, and then these are developing larval cells over here. They're all more uniform and lighter in color. And then over here is an even younger uh, cluster of, of, uh, of larvae. And over here's another cluster of larvae. So she'll begin laying them in these bunches on the pollen. This is a pollen um, pellet that we fed this colony in the lab. And then the other thing to show you here is you'll notice these little wax envelopes. These are those, uh, these are called honey pots. So they build these honey pots and sometimes they use um, emerged brood cells. They'll pack honey and, and uh, pollen into these. Uh, and so 
you get these little pots there that they can store some food into. This is, um, so that first one, this was July 1st. So we've given her a, a solid month and a half to develop and this is where she is. Um, July 1st or July 16th, however, that you can see the same colony is growing. Just to point you out inside of a bumblebee nest, a bumblebee colony, this is one that was produced by um, BioBest, a commercial company. Here's where the nectar is fed. So they just throw on a tank of, um, of sugar syrup and they can feed right through it. So they get all the sugar they want. And then we feed them these chunks of pollen in here. And you can see now this is just two weeks later from when the last picture we saw, and you'll notice the number of workers in here is much bigger and the nest itself is much bigger and more complex. So I pointed out that one chunk of brood to you of larvae um, that you saw in the last one. Now these are all pupae. Uh, same with this one over here. These have all become pupae. She started a new uh, larval mass here. There's a larval mass out here. There's one over here and there's actually two on this side. So this nest is, we are now in exponential growth phase. This is about to take off. Once these larvae come out, you'll see the next picture, um, they're everywhere. And you'll notice there's a lot more worker bees doing work. And they're all blurry because they're working really hard. And actually, if you look really close, you can see this one right here. There's a worker just uh, chewing its way out of a, a pupil cell. So um, workers beginning to come out very quickly. Okay, so that was sort of this early summer phase. We're like right here now, that last picture we saw, there's some workers and they're, they're going, um, but it's gonna start growing quickly. And, and the next couple of pictures I'm gonna show you, we're gonna start seeing where the, where the nest is even larger than that um, and grows even more. So we're now moving from that exponential growth phase into that switching point. And this will show you how quickly it can happen. So this is a week after that last picture um, you can see here's a whole bunch of bees that we just fed them pollen and they're all over it. Um, all of those pupil cells that we saw last time have now emerged and they're now storing nectar in those. Um, and, uh, and more and more, there's a, one of the brood lumps that's now um, pupil. A lot of these are emerging, tons of bees coming out. And so um, moving on here real quickly. This is now another week later even more emerged. There's now these big lumps of, of brood here. Um, and you can see all these bees that are around. And so here we go. We've got, um, this is just to, to orient you. You can see the shiny um, liquid inside of these. These are now honey pots, but they've now converted. They're no longer building too many new honey pots. These are actually, uh, these were strict honey pots. They've never been used for brood during, but these are now repurposed brood um, cells that are now honey pots. Um, in this one, you can kind of see the different color. They're storing pollen in this, and it looks like they're actually storing pollen in these ones too that they've built. So they've got some pollen storage going on. Um, at this point, these, this is a nest that we're feeding every day. We have to keep putting pollen in pretty constantly. They're, they're all over the nectar. Um, and there's a lot of bees here. This new brood is most likely at this point male. So they're no longer gonna produce workers. And then there's some larger cells here in the center that are likely gonna be the new gynes. It's, it's hard to tell with brood uh, cell size if you're not like really able to open it up and look into it, but these are larger and they look like they're gonna be new queens. Um, so those are some of the features of this nest as it grows. Um, and then this just this is just zooming in a little bit more, but here you see the queen. She's still working. She's still doing her thing. Um, this nest, I counted the workers. There were 70 workers at this point. So they went from that, um, in a month, they went from that point of having four or five workers to having well over 70. And then as these next um, cells emerge, they'll probably go over 100 uh, on this. But now there's lots of these brood lumps that are kind of coming off to the sides. And this is what this is usually is um, these are usually new new male brood. So they've hit that switching point. The nest has gotten crowded enough and she's kind of losing control of her workers. And sometimes, in fact, her own workers will lay eggs that will produce. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So somebody asked how big can these get um, and how many they'll they'll produce. These are this is actually all data from my lab. These are um, mean colony sizes for these five species that we raised. Uh, for a couple of years. And uh, Bombus griseocolis, which is a fairly common species, never got really huge in the lab. They may get bigger. 
Again, these are all lab, so things can happen differently outside the lab. This is just what we're able to make happen in the lab. Uh, Bombus bifarius, something like 75 um, total, total bees. This is, um, I say total bees, this is um, workers plus males. We, we couldn't separate all of them for sure, so we just lumped them together because um, we were counting brood cells. But with um, Bombus huntii, uh, the hunt bumblebee, we frequently got to... Um, the sort of an average of 200 and about 260, 270 uh, total individuals in the lab, but we had nests that reached well over 650. Um, again, in the lab, they tend not to do quite as well as they do out in nature when, when they're doing their own thing. Uh, Bombus fosnesenski, another colony, uh, these are both used commercially, these two species, and you can see why, because they have lots of workers to do foraging in greenhouses. Um, again, about 250. Uh, Bombus occidentalis, smaller, but um, still, pretty good uh, nest sizes, well over 100 individuals on average. Um, and I could give you some of the caveats around how this data was generated, but this just gives you a relative size. So, um, and generally speaking, something like two thirds of these would be, or, or half of these would be workers, foraging workers at any given time. So it's one way to think of it. Um, and then to sort of go back to the pollen and how much pollen um, they needed. We did this study where we looked at the number or how much how much weight in pollen um, it costs them to make a bee. So um, the real bars you want to look at are sort of these these gray ones because it's averaged. We we looked at it like well how much total pollen does a colony need to make a queen and how much total pollen does a colony need to make a, a male. Um, and the reality is so these the yellow would be like how much it takes to make a queen, but some colonies don't produce many queens so. Um, so a, an individual queen can be very expensive uh, for pollen uh, on average, but but the real cost per bee is are these little gray bars down here. And so we figured on average across these eight colonies, it, it was about 470 milligrams per bee. And for those of you who aren't you know thinking of milligrams all the time, this is about a little over two ibuprofens worth of um, pollen, right? So if you have if you if you're taking your ibuprofen for your uh, bad back and you've got two of them, that's about 400 milligrams. Um, and, and so this is just slightly over that. So that's about how much pollen it takes foraging to, to get to that. Uh, and if you're really curious, um, a bee can bring in about 26 milligrams. They can actually bring a little bit more in uh, per foraging trip, but the average that Dave Goulson, uh, this researcher in the UK found with Bombus terrestris, um, the earth bumblebee uh, was that they brought in 26.3 milligrams per foraging trip. And that means it's about 18 pollen foraging trips per bee that the colony is producing. So they got to do a lot of foraging to make bees. Um, so it is fairly, fairly expensive. Those were for workers, by the way. So a queen obviously is larger. They can bring in more weight um, of, of pollen on each trip. So they have to do fewer trips to make workers. And one of the other interesting thing about bumblebees is that they they have um, uh, size differences in workers. So within the worker cast, you can have little tiny workers and you can have big workers. And what usually happens is in the spring of the year when the queen is doing all the foraging and raising all the bees, the workers are smaller. So she doesn't have to get as much pollen to make each of these individual bees. So in her case, it might be less. It might be um, down to about you know, 300 milligrams per bee because she's making a smaller worker. Whereas later in the season, when you have big colonies with a lot of workers, they can actually afford to get 470 milligrams per bee. And some of this is also factored into the, the queen. So uh, workers, workers are gonna be less than this number. Males are gonna be less than this number. Queens probably a little higher than this number. All right, so we talked about winter and mating. So I wanna talk about the, this, uh, the circles around winter, but really we're, this is pre-winter because we're focusing on the mating here, the, the queens and the males coming together. So this is before they start that wintering phase. Um, so this happens in late summer. Again, that depends on where you live and what species you're looking at, what late summer means. Um, I wish I could give you a date like August 15th to September 15th, but I can't. Um, so I can tell you about some species and um, the ones that are common. And so something like Bombus impatiens in Columbus, Ohio is going to be um, really early August to mid-September is the time we're talking about mating and reproduction um, for something like um, uh, 
Bombus Rufo Synctus out in Utah, then the, the times would actually be um, much, uh, probably a little bit earlier, probably August 15th and, and then end by September 1st. Um, but if you're up in the mountains, all bets are off. It's gotta be before the snowfall. So um, they're probably done by mid-August. Um, so this happens in that late summer period. Queens and males will emerge from the nests. Males generally precede the queens a little bit. So there's often a lot of males coming into the, the, the environment um, and kind of out there waiting for the, the queens to emerge. And the males will leave the nest and they'll fly around and, and nectar. And they actually, you know, male bumblebees do a fair amount of pollination, not because they're collecting pollen to take back to the nest, but because they're doing a lot of flying and nectaring uh, and bringing, bringing it back in. Um, and then um, I wanted to sort of underscore too that workers do produce males. So this is another um, study that a student of mine, Devin Picklum and I did, uh, where we looked at a bunch of colonies we had raised in the lab to see the, and we were interested in how many times these, these um, uh, individual colonies, these individual queens mated. Uh, that's on the next slide, so I don't wanna give that away. But we were looking at that. But one of the cool things we did was we also looked at the, the male offspring of these colonies to see um, how many were sons of, of that queen. So how many were eggs that she laid and how many were eggs that her daughters laid. Um, and so this data here shows these are a number of species. And then um, for the ones that we have data for, you can see it's anywhere between 13 and 33% of the males that we sampled in these colonies were produced by her workers. So honeybees, it's almost zero because when the queen lays a, a male egg, um, it develops, but when a worker lays a male egg, other workers eat that and police it. In the case of bumblebees, what happens is you have those little brood clumps on the side and, um, and those workers will, um, they'll actually uh, defend their own brood clumps. And so they, they will raise their own males. Um, and so yeah, it's pretty common. The, the take home message from the mating study is that most species only mate once, but about 10% of bees in some species will actually mate multiply. And we did find some that mated um, uh, two, three, four times uh, across species. And so this paper is unfortunately not out yet, but, um, but we are getting close to submitting it. So hopefully uh, we, can, we can put this in the literature, but this is known from some European species as well. So we're not, we're not changing um, the paradigm here or anything like that. Uh, they have four general mating strategies among bumblebee males. There's this ambush strategy where the males will wait outside nest entrances. And when queens from those nests come out, they'll just kind of pounce. Um, um, sometimes they'll catch them in the air. Sometimes they'll catch them before they get uh, off to fly. But, but this is called ambush mating. Uh, there's hilltopping where the males will fly. Uh, they'll kind of look for a high point in the landscape and they'll fly there. And then when queens fly up to those high points, they'll mate with them there. Um, another strategy is trap lining where the males will usually have a circuit where they will go and they'll stop and they'll deposit a little pheromone and they fly and they'll do this around a circuit and they keep coming through. And actually um, Charles Darwin in The Origin of Species um, talked about observing this behavior in England while he was writing that book uh, of trap lining and bees um, and bumblebees do this. And then the final one is perching. So there's a number of species and you'll notice these that when you're looking through the identification uh, section, the males that have really large eyes are perchers because what they do is they perch in a meadow. And when they see a queen, often sometimes it's not a queen, when they see a large bee looking thing fly through, they take off after it and try to catch it. And so this is kind of scramble competition, a bunch of males that may be perching around a meadow are, are all doing this and they'll actually fight over perching sites to try to get the best site to do this. So perching is another strategy. And like I said, you can always tell the species to do this because the males have really big eyes. Um, wintering phase and queen hibernation. And I'm gonna actually cut this off in a moment, but because I wanna make sure we have a few seconds for questions here before we go into next week. Um, but actually, you know what? Um, since, uh, how about I do this? I will talk about, we're gonna talk about queen wintering, but let's do it next week. Um, and that way uh, we'll have plenty of time for it and we have plenty of time for questions now. So uh, there's only a couple slides left here so it'll be easy to cover next week. Okay, Jamie, so there were several questions that make me think that, um, can you talk about what happens to that summer queen? Because some people were asking how many years does she overwinter, um, et cetera, yeah. So. Oh, yeah. So, so the queen, yeah, so um, sadly, um, the queen that comes out in the spring, this queen that emerges and founds that nest, she dies usually in here. Um, 
they often sometimes will even die uh, before. So they may lay a couple of, of clump of, <clears throat> sorry, male eggs and, um, and new queen eggs. Uh, and then they, they usually just don't make it past that. So they do not survive more than one year. Okay. They, they, they have a pretty much an annual life cycle. So does that newly mated uh, guy, does she overwinter in the nest, folks want to know, or does she overwinter somewhere else? Well, that's, again, that's like the million dollar question, right? So we don't really know um, where all of them mate. Some, we do know that, that, for example, Bombus impatiens, the common Eastern bumblebee, some portion of them will overwinter in that nest site or very near it. So um, we will see that sometimes with them returning to their nest site uh, and then uh, spending the winter there. For most species, however, we have very little data on where they actually spend the winter. Okay. We, sim we simply don't know. Okay. Uh, Bill wants to know what happens after a queen emerges in the spring um, and we get a long cold spell that inhibits uh, flower production. Yeah, it, it, interestingly, uh, it, it, so timing is really important on that. Um, it, a lot of, if the queen has already gotten out and established um, a nest, and so she's she's found a protected spot and she's provisioned it with, with nectar and pollen, she can often survive multiple days in that nest site without any real um, repercussions to her. So um, it depends on how long the cold spell lasts, depends on how long flowers aren't available, but um, usually they're okay. If she has not yet established a nest, she simply goes dormant again. Um, and so in that case, she's actually really resilient to uh, spring cold snap. So it depends on where she is at nest establishment. And what can happen sometimes is she'll even establish a nest, lay eggs. If the cold snaps a long time, she'll abort the eggs she's laid there um, and then come back out and, and restart in that same site later. But so they have the ability to kind of start and stop that a little bit. But if it's really long, she's probably not going to make it. Uh, Lee is wondering about elderberries and lots of people upvoted. So a lot of people are wondering about elderberries. Is there anything special about the, them that may cause bumbles to nest um, around the roots of elderberries? I don't know about this. Is this, uh, is this a thing? Um, uh, I, I, if it's I not a thing to you, Jamie, I'm not sure it's a thing. <laughs> well, no, I mean, if, if somebody's uh, observed it, that's really neat. But um, I know I don't know. Um, okay. No, I, and elderberries, I think, you know, if you look at the flowers, you will see bees on them, but um, there are a, a lot of elderberries. Uh, there's a lot of flies that pollinate elderberry. It's, um, it's, a good, it's a good fly plant, which again, if you're not into pollination, maybe isn't so exciting for you, but. <laughs> um, there's a question that's uh, right at the top of the thumbs up list about the rusty patch bumblebee. And if there's anything, uh, that Mary can do to attract this particular bee or any um, quick ways to identify? Well, um, the, 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 the quick, you know, sort of the quick way to identify is, is they're actually, actually queen, queen rusty patch are very hard to identify and tell apart from some other species. Um, and that's going to be covered in that Eastern identification class. I don't want to spoil that too much, but certainly with the workers and males, they do have that kind of distinctive patch on their second, on this kind of second thoracic segment right here. It'll be mostly yellow, but it'll have that nice little patch there. Um, but it, it is one that can also be fairly easily confused with things like the brown belted bumblebee. Um, some of those can, can be a little confusing uh, to tell them apart, but that would be for the um, class. As far as attracting them, um, yeah, I, I wish we knew that, right? Because that would be, then we wouldn't have this endangered species problem that we have if we knew how to um, improve particular habitats or things for them. But diverse plantings seem to be really important. Um, but but location seems to be the most important. Um, if you're not living in an area where that bee is currently known to exist, then um, it's kind of hard to to attract them into a particular spot. So. Sure. Uh, Carolyn wonders when she can do her yard cleanup. Should she do it now before you talk again next week or should she wait a little bit? Any advice on uh, what we can do to help the bumbles there? Well, you know, so yard cleanup, if it's in like grass and things like that, then I wouldn't worry too much. If you're talking about your flower beds, um, I would say like in, if you're going to remove a lot of the dead material um, to do that, you can do it now. I don't think it would matter so much. 
which you don't want to do if you have, say, like clumps of leaves and things around the base of some plants is to remove those after the bees have started nesting. Because if you disturb that nest, they're likely to, to move on or to abandon it altogether. Um, and so I would say either clean early um, or, or if you're going to clean your yard later and, and remove some of that stuff, then, um, then, uh, then probably be careful and, and pay attention. If you see bees in an area, a queen bee, especially investigating an area, you'll see her crawling around the ground or flying low and kind of looking at something. You might not want to clean that up because that might mean that she's, she's interested in nesting there. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, we just have a couple more minutes, but the um, question got a lot of votes uh, about honeybees and whether there's competition with honeybees and bumblebees. Performance. Yeah, so, so I showed that one pollen slide, and that was, you know, sort of my my big um, chunk of of data on that. So there is there will be some competition. There's always going to be competition. You put multiple species. It's just that's how um, ecology works, right? If you put multiple species that occupy similar niches into the same environment, um, they're going to be competing for those. So yes, there is some competition out there. We don't have a really strong handle on how much. I put that slide with bumblebee and honeybee pollen in there to show that, that while there is competition for some things like flowers in the pea family um, and rosaceous plants, that it's not a one-to-one. -one. Um, there's overlap, but it's not necessarily direct head-on-head -head competition. Bumblebees can get food that honeybees simply won't go for, and the other way around works too. Um, but there is a certain amount of food that they overlap on, on as far as forging. And then for nectar though, that's where the competition is going to be direct because they will visit the same plants for nectar. Um, and generally plants that are good at producing nectar attract both bumblebees and, and honeybees. So, um, so yeah, right in the nectar area, there's going to be direct competition. Um, there's not really competition for nesting sites. There's not, um, there, there's some, there's also, as we'll talk about next week, some transfer of pathogens and parasites back and forth. Um, but uh, so yeah, yes, there's, I think by necessity, there's competition. That's, that's just how nature works. Um, but it's not a clear one-to-one -one B ratio. Okay, great. Well, I think as a time we should go ahead and finish up. We didn't get to all 250 questions. Sorry, everybody had lots of great <laughs> questions. Um, and I know Jamie would love to answer them all. Maybe be good, good uh, fodder for uh, a book, Jamie. Uh, folks, I'm sure Jamie would love a thank you in the chat box for, um, for his time this afternoon. We'll be back together with Jamie next week, kind of finishing up some of that foundational uh, bumblebee biology information and also with... Um, a little bit on endangered bumblebees next week. And uh, so Jamie, thanks again, really appreciate your time. All right, Denise, thanks everybody.